Sara Maria Aldrete Villarreal was born on September 6, 1964, the daughter of a Matamoros electrician. She crossed the border to attend Porter High School in Brownsville, where teachers remember her as a model student and a good kid. She maintained her star pupil status in secretarial school, instructors urging her to attend a real college, but romance intervened. On Halloween Day in 1983 Aldrete married Brownsville resident Miguel Zacharias, 11 years her senior. The relationship quickly soured and five months later they were separated, moving inexorably toward divorce. Late in 1985 Aldrete applied for and received resident alien status in the United States. Her next step was enrollment at Texas Southmost College, a two-year school in Brownsville. Admitted on a work-study program that deferred part of her tuition, Sarah began classes in January 1986 as a physical education major, holding down two part-time jobs as an aerobics teacher and assistant secretary in the school's athletic department by the end of her first semester Aldrete stood out physically and academically. Standing at six foot one, she was unusually tall for a Mexican woman and her grades were excellent. She was one of 33 students chosen from TSC's 6,500-member student body for listing in the school's Who's Who directory for 1987-88. Aside from grades that placed her on the honor roll, Aldrete also organized and led a booster club for TSC's soccer team, earning the school's Outstanding Physical Education Award in her spare time. With the breakup of her marriage, Aldrete had moved back home with her parents in Matamoros, constructing a special outside stairway to her second-floor room in the interest of privacy. She was home most weekends and during school vacations, looking forward to completion of her studies and the transfer to a four-year school that would bring her a PE teaching certificate. Attractive and popular with men, in 1987 she was dating Gilberto Sosa, a drug dealer associated with the powerful Hernandez family. Aldrete was driving through Matamoros on July 30, 1987 when a shiny new Mercedes cut her off in traffic, narrowly avoiding a collision. The driver was apologetic, suave and handsome. He introduced himself as Adolfo Constanzo, a Cuban-American living in Mexico City. There was an instant chemistry between them, but Constanzo made no sexual overtures. He noted with pleasure that Aldrete's birthday was the same as his mother's. In fact, the meeting was no accident. Constanzo had been watching Gilberto Sosa, weighing his connections. The meeting with Sarah Aldrete was carefully stage-managed, as was their burgeoning friendship and her gradual introduction into the occult. Two weeks after their first encounter, Constanzo met Aldrete and Sosa in Brownsville, pointedly refusing to shake Sosa's hand. Days later, an anonymous caller told Sosa that Aldrete was seeing another man. Jealous, he refused to accept her denials and broke off the relationship. She turned to Constanzo for solace, surprised when he told her he had seen the breakup coming in his tarot cards. Constanzo finally took Aldrete to bed, but their sexual union was short-lived. He made no secret of his preference for men, and Aldrete grudgingly accepted it, already hooked on the religious aspect of their relationship. By summer's end, Aldrete's TSC classmates found her dramatically changed, an overnight expert on witchcraft and magic, eager to debate the relative powers of darkness and light. In private, Constanzo called her La Madrina, the godmother of his growing cult. He probed her links to the Hernandez clan, predicting that leader Elio would soon approach her for advice about a problem. When Elio did so, in November 1987, Sarah introduced the dealer to El Padrino. As it happened, the Hernandez family was ripe for a takeover, torn by internal dissension and threatened by outside competitors. Using every magic trick at his disposal, Constanzo persuaded Elio and the rest that Paolo Mayambi could solve all their problems. Enemies could be eliminated in the course of sacrificial rituals, those rituals, in turn, would keep the family and its employees safe from harm. If they were faithful to Constanzo, his disciples would become invisible to the authorities and bulletproof in combat. In return, all he asked was 50% of the profits and effective control of the family. Constanzo's rituals became more elaborate and sadistic after he moved his cult headquarters to Rancho Santa Elena, 20 miles outside Matamoros. There, on May 28, 1988, Constanzo shot drug dealer Hector de la Fuente and a farmer named Moises Castillo, but the sacrifices didn't satisfy him. 
Back in Mexico City, on July 16, he supervised the torture and dismemberment of Raúl Paz Esquivel, a transvestite and former lover of cult member Jorge Montes. The gruesome remains were dumped on a public street, found by children who ran shrieking to summon police. Mutilation and pain were essential to Paulo Mayambi. Blood and viscera fed the naganga, manipulated with sticks as Constanzo tuned in the spirit world. The demons he served were more likely to smile on a sacrifice that died in agony. They must die screaming, El Padrino told his flock. As for the point in nearly every sacrifice where Constanzo sodomized his victims, that was simply a fringe benefit of playing God. On August 10, 1988, in reprisal for an $800,000 drug ripoff, rival narcotics dealers kidnapped Ovidio Hernandez and his two-year-old sons. Constanzo's ghoul squad kidnapped a stranger two days later and tortured him to death at Rancho Santa Elena, chanting prayers for the safe release of Hernandez and son. When the hostages were released on August 13, without a peso's ransom changing hands, Constanzo claimed full credit for the triumph. His star was rising, and Constanzo paid little attention to the suicide of his disciple Florentino Ventura in Mexico City on September 17. Ventura also killed his wife and a friend with the same burst of gunfire. In November 1988, after 35-year-old ex-cop and cult member Jorge Valente de Fierro Gomez violated El Padrino's ban on using drugs, Constanzo made him the group's next offering to Cadiam Pembe, a bloody object lesson in obedience. Competing smuggler Ezequiel Rodriguez Luna was tortured to death at the ranch on Valentine's Day 1989, Two other dealers, Ruben Villa Garza and Ernesto Rivas Diaz were added to the grisly list when they wandered into the ceremony uninvited. Nine days later, the cult kidnapped another stranger, never identified, but he put up such a fight that Constanzo ordered Elio Hernandez to shoot him without the customary rituals. On February 25, the prowling cultists accidentally kidnapped Jose Garcia, Elio's 14-year-old cousin, slaying him before they recognized the error. By that time Constanzo was sitting on 800 kilos of marijuana stolen from another gang, but felt he needed one more sacrifice to guarantee safe shipment across the Rio Grande. Another ritual was staged on March 13, 1989, but the victim's suffering was insufficient for Constanzo's taste. Bring me someone I can use, he told his minions. Someone who will scream. The next morning, they brought him Mark Kilroy. Constanzo's psychic powers must have failed him in March 1989, for he was stunned by the reaction to Mark Kilroy's disappearance. Not even the Calzada family slaughter had produced such an outcry, most observers concluding that drug dealers and their lackeys were beyond protection of the law, a violent death their just reward. Some of Constanzo's victims had never been reported missing, three of them, later unearthed with the rest at Rancho Santa Elena, have never been identified. But Mark Kilroy was different. He came from an affluent family with political connections. More to the point, he was an Anglo tourist whose fate threatened to become an international incident. Local police wanted to solve the case quickly, before their tarnished reputation suffered any further damage. Constanzo, for his part, still had 800 kilos of marijuana to move across the border. To safeguard the shipment, he staged one final sacrifice at the ranch, choosing Sarah Aldrit's old lover as the guest of honor. Gilberto Sosa died screaming on March 28, 1989, and the dope was safely transported on April 8, despite Serafin Hernandez leading police to the ranch one week earlier. Constanzo's mules collected $300,000 for the load, while El Padrino congratulated himself on his magical powers. The protective shield of magic was lifted the next day. Four members of the Hernandez family were arrested on April 9, before they could give Constanzo the cash from his last big deal. The ranch began surrendering its buried secrets on April 11, the butchered remains of 15 victims unearthed over the next six days. Besides the first 12 buried in the cemetery, three more were found in a nearby orchard. Constanzo went on the lam, traveling with Sarah Aldrit, male lovers Martin Quintana and Omar Orea, and a Hernandez family hit man named Alvaro de Leon Valdez, El Duby, to his friends. Miami beckoned, but informers told the Dia Constanzo might run home to mother, and the heat in Florida persuaded him to remain in Mexico City, shuttling from the home of one disciple to another. 
The discoveries at Matamoros were tailor-made for tabloid television circa 1989. Geraldo Rivera aired a special primetime segment on the case, while TV journalists flew in from the United States, Europe, and even Japan. Constanzo was cited as far north as Chicago, where rumors placed him in league with the Windy City Mafia. Sarah Aldrete was seen lurking around schools throughout the Rio Grande Valley, word of mouth reports claiming she had threatened to kidnap and murder 10 Anglo children for each of her disciples jailed in Mexico. An alternative church at Farr, Texas, was burned by night riders after tales spread that its congregants were witches in thrall to Constanzo. Still Laman scoured the border in vain for El Padrino and his entourage, barely mollified by the April 17 arrest of gang patriarch Serafin Hernandez Rivera in Houston. Searching the house where he had been hiding, they seized weapons and cash, but found no occult paraphernalia. Constanzo and his closest aides, meanwhile, had simply disappeared. Like magic. Constanzo read betrayal in his tarot cards on April 18, 1989. He knew informers must have sold out Serafin Sr., and now he eyed his friends more warily. He kept an Uzi close at hand and rarely slept for more than a few minutes at a time. Increasingly, he threatened those around him with a power exceeding that of the police. They cannot kill you, he insisted, but I can. On April 22, nocturnal arsonists struck at Rancho Santa Elena, burning Constanzo's blood-stained ritual shed to the ground. The next morning he flew into a rage, watching on television as police conducted a full-dress exorcism at the ranch, sprinkling holy water over the graves and smoldering ashes. Constanzo stormed about the small apartment where he slept with Aldrete and the others, smashing lamps and overturning furniture, a man possessed. On April 24 police arrested cultist Jorge Montes, raiding his home three blocks from the site where the Calzada family was slaughtered in 1986. Like the others arrested before him, Montes spilled everything he knew about the cult, naming Constanzo as the mastermind and chief executioner in a string of grisly homicides. Three days later, Constanzo and his four remaining cohorts settled into their last hideout, an apartment house on Rio Sena in Mexico City. Aldrete, fearing for her life, penned a note on May 2 and tossed it from a bedroom window to the street below. It read, Please call the judicial police and tell them that in this building are those that they are seeking. Tell them that a woman is being held hostage. I beg for this, because what I want most is to talk, or they're going to kill the girl. A passerby found the note moments later, read it, and kept it to himself, believing it was someone's lame attempt at humor. Upstairs, in the crowded flat, Constanzo began laying plans to flee Mexico with his hardcore disciples, perhaps starting fresh somewhere else. They'll never take me, he assured his followers. Those plans unraveled on May 6, 1989, when police arrived on Rio Sena, going door to door and asking questions. As luck would have it, they were searching for a missing child, a completely unrelated case, but when Constanzo glimpsed them from a window he panicked, opening fire with his submachine gun. Within moments, 180 policemen surrounded the apartment house returning fire in a fierce exchange that lasted some 45 minutes. Miraculously, the only person wounded was an officer struck by Constanzo's first shots. When Constanzo realized that escape was impossible, he handed his weapon to El Duby and issued new orders. As the hitman later told police, he told me to kill him and Martin. I told him I couldn't do it, but he hit me in the face and threatened that everything would go bad for me in hell. Then he hugged Martin, and I just stood in front of them and shot them with a machine gun. Constanzo and Quintana were dead when police stormed the apartment, slumped together in a closet, Constanzo dressed in shorts as if for a day at the beach. The three survivors, El Duby, Orea and Sarah Aldrete, were promptly arrested and rushed off to jail. In custody, El Duby admitted shooting Constanzo, but he cheerfully informed police, the Godfather will not be dead for long. Mexican authorities were less concerned with Constanzo's impending resurrection than with making charges stick against the surviving cultists. 
El Dubi's case was open and shut, his confession recorded on two murder counts, but Sarah Aldrete first posed as a victim, betraying herself when she protested too much, revealing intimate knowledge of the cult's bloody rituals. In the wake of the Mexico City shootout, 14 cult members were indicted on various charges, including multiple murder, weapons and narcotics violations, conspiracy and obstruction of justice. In August 1990, El Dubi was convicted of killing Constanzo and Quintana, drawing a 35-year prison term. Cultists Juan Fragosa and Jorge Montes were both convicted of Raúl Esquivel's murder and sentenced to 35 years each. Omar Orea, convicted in the same case, died of AIDS before he could be sentenced. Sarah Aldrete was acquitted of Constanzo's slaying in 1990 but was sentenced to a six-year term on conviction of criminal association. La Madrina insisted that she never practiced any religion but, Christian Santeria, televised reports of the murders at Rancho Santa Elena, she said, took her completely by surprise. Jurors disagreed, and in 1994, when Aldrete and four male accomplices were convicted of multiple slayings at the ranch. Aldrete was sentenced to 62 years, while her cohorts, including Elio Hernandez and Serafin Jr., drew prison terms of 67 years. American authorities stand ready to prosecute Aldrete, El Dubi and the Hernandez clan for Mark Kilroy's murder, should they ever be released from custody. But is their evil vanquished, even now? A grisly list of cult-related crimes remains unsolved in Mexico. From prison, Sarah Aldrete told reporters, I don't think the religion will end with us, because it has a lot of people in it. They have found a temple in Monterey that isn't even related to us. It will continue. Between 1987 and 1989, police in Mexico City recorded 74 unsolved ritual murders, 14 of them involving infant victims. Constanzo's cult is suspected in at least 16 of those cases, all involving children or teenagers, but authorities lack sufficient evidence to press charges. Referring to those cases, prosecutor Guillermo Ibarra told reporters, we would like to say, yes, Constanzo did them all, and poof, all those cases are solved. And the fact is, we believe he was responsible for some of them, though we'll never prove it now. But he didn't commit all of those murders. Which means someone else did. Someone who is still out there.